All right. Good afternoon. It's the time of uh, the month again for the annual monthly ISFSI uh, Hump Day Hangout. Uh, we're here today. We're going to talk uh, about some topics that are relevant to today's fire service. Uh, we're going to get into some training aspects, but we're going to talk a little bit about recruiting, retaining uh, quality employees. And I think it's an issue a lot of us are facing uh, as we're moving forward and having to fill vacancies of our 25 and 30 year veterans. Um, talk a little bit today about fire engineering. Uh, if you're not subscribed yet to Fire Engineering Magazine, jump on board and get the magazine delivered to your house. Um, I know a lot of people are going online and things like that, but I can tell you the quality of that magazine uh, delivery to your homes, your fire station, um, put it out on the kitchen tables and things like that at your stations. Uh, it's, it's a great conversation starter, if nothing else, great uh, information in there for uh, training um, to get those conversations started, to get some good training out uh, to your people. Um, FDIC is right around the corner. We let Chief Halton talk about that here in a little bit, but uh, get registered for that. The hot programs are going to be filling up fast as they always do. So make sure you're uh, on board and getting registered for that. Uh, we got a few guys coming from my department uh, again this year, and uh, they were already talking about some of the classes being uh, close to full, which is crazy because the thing is just, just opening up. <laughs> so uh, we'll go around the horn here. We'll start with the uh, fire engineering group with Chief Halton and get some introductions. I've got with me Glenn Corbett, Professor Glenn Corbett from John Jay College. He was a firefighter in San Antonio and Austin, and uh, he's now a professor at John Jay College where he teaches fire, everything fire uh, from administrative to building inspection to construction to operations. It, John Jay has the whole array, and he's also the oldest senior technical editor for fire engineering. He's been with fire engineering 30 years now. Wow. Yeah, 1984, I guess. 1984. So he's been a technical editor since then. So certainly knows his stuff. So that's a blessing. And yes, uh, we're we're tracking way ahead of our 2019 numbers. And if people remember 2019 at FDIC, it was close to 40,000 people. So we're ahead of that right now uh, in terms of uh, people enrolling for classes. So the hands-on training will sell out fast. So please, you know, get with it. And one of the reasons it's selling so fast is we now offer group pricing from groups of three or more. So three, four, five, six. So if you've got three or more people coming from your organization, you're getting a discount that just about affords you to send a fourth person. And that gets you to send like a, 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 a fourth and a half person or whatever, however it works. But it's pretty well done. The, the marketing people did a great job. All the way up to 10 people, there's increments from three to 10. So if you're a smaller organization, Please take advantage of the group pricing. Don't have people go in individually. And even if you're just, you know, three friends from a, a local area, take advantage of it because there's substantial savings there for you. So <clears throat> that's happening. Some really good new classes. Uh, uh, Jason DeFoss is going to have real electric vehicles there. So it's brand new. It should be very exciting. I mean, Bobby Eckert's going to be doing some new stuff. And remember that many of the hands-on training classes, as well as over 100 and 150 of our other classes are EMS certified. So in other words, you take eight hours of uh, you know, extrication, you're gonna get eight hours of EMT CE towards your EMT license, your paramedical license. It's all CAPC accredited. You have to go in, you know, go put your information in so that they can you know, know your license number and all that stuff so they can send it to you. But um, I believe there's over 230 hours of CAPC accredited EMS stuff interspersed throughout the hands-on and the regular classroom stuff, which is huge. Because all of us as training officers know that those are mandatory requirements that we have to fulfill. And it's always a bugaboo bringing in one or two men or women to get them up to speed on their EMS calls and certs. Because generally, those are the ones we, we miss for whatever reason. I think it's just because there's so many of them, right? Not that it's right or wrong or good or bad. But, but we decided to really incorporate that. And the gyms games... Uh, they have some, some exciting announcements. There's a new trailer coming out to show it. But the Gems games are where medic teams come and compete. So they're basically three-person teams, and they're taking it back to the streets. So if you're doing EMS on the streets, then you can compete in the Gems games. If, you're, if you've got men and women rolling out there, so when they enroll, they have to put up 100 bucks for the team, but they, the whole team gets complimentary passes. The first 10 teams get complimentary passes to the show. So if you've got a four-person team, they pay the 100 bucks, they can come to all the classes because they're going to compete. They have to come in early because the prelims are Monday, Tuesday, but they can go to classes all day Wednesday, all day Thursday, and then Friday, if they make the finals, the final four teams come, they'd be in the finals. If they don't make the finals, they can come and watch. But the Gems games, if you haven't seen the Gems games, 
blow you away, absolutely blow you away. It's like a movie set where the medics come on and they've got to do, you know, their thing. And, and uh, it's all about street medicine. It's not, you know, it's, it's about street medicine. So irrespective of your organization, career volunteer, if you've got medics doing EMS on the street, they can compete at the GEMS games. So it's a great way to get, you know, more of your men and women to the show and, and have a great time and maybe bragging rights at the end of the day, we got the best medics in the country working here because uh, that, that's, that's what the GEMS games do. They, the best of the best compete against one another. New York City has won it a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I think Tokyo has won a couple of times, but uh, it's a really cool deal. So um, what am I missing? All the usual stuff, the Fool's Bash, Stop, Drop, Rock and Roll. Uh, Brian Zates will be uh, speaking on Thursday on the main program. So mark your calendars for that. Lifetime opportunity to hear the man himself up on the stage. <laughs> Danny Sharon will also be speaking. And Brian Brush from the Rescue Project, he'll also be speaking on the main program. The Lifetime Achievement is going to Steve Chikorotis from Chicago Fire, a Chicago Fire Department member for 35 years, retired deputy chief. But he's also the guy who was the subject matter expert for Backdraft and for Chicago Fire. If you're a fan of Chicago Fire, he's the guy who occasionally plays Chief Walker. You know, everybody gets in trouble and they, the chief comes in from headquarters, Chief Walker. That's Chikorotis. And you can always tell because he's the guy who's a really crappy actor. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because he's really just one of us, right? But a super guy. So he'll be getting lifetime achievement. And um, I don't know if his instructor of the year hasn't been picked yet because you guys yeah. do that. So we'll we'll be able to announce that pretty soon. So I can't wait to see who that's going to be. Um, IFSI will be holding a, a mixer, um, a cocktail mixer. You're not holding your regular meeting this year, as I understand. We're doing a regular meeting on Tuesday night in association so that people can attend the expo and the classroom sessions on Friday. So that that's way it's a important. great idea. That's a great idea. So so you guys, if you're not a member of I, if you're not a member of the Instructor Society, what are you doing? Because that's also a way to get a discount for FDIC. And so not only that, but all the materials, the training sessions, basement fires, all that live fire training classes, all that's available through the instructor society. So, you know, what are you what are you what are you waiting for? If you're serious about being a, a firefighter and I'll, and I'll kind of lead into the discussion, if you don't mind, uh, Brian, our job as fire officers in a department is to hire the right people and to train them to be leaders. And if we do that, if we spend 80% of our time and energy in selecting the right people and teaching them how to make decisions and how to you know, perform, all the other stuff is gonna work itself out. In other words, they will find the solutions to all those problems down the road. The hard, the hard work and the important work is what we're gonna talk about today. How do we locate, recruit, and, and train the right people so that the, the virtues and the, the values and the morality that has gotten the fire service to be the most envied occupation in the world for its integrity and character. How do we find those people and, and, and what, what does that training look like? And then that's going to be the topic for today. And that is the job of the leadership of any fire department. It's the number one job, apparatus, equipment, working conditions, alerting systems, inspection says all, all that's important. But recruiting and training those people to be the future leaders, that's the most important thing we do. All right, we'll wrap that up. We got it done there in 10 minutes now. <laughs> Demon, always great seeing you. Hello, sir. How you doing? Hopefully Good. you're going to ask me to speak right now because it's kind of hard to follow up after Chief Halton um, comments so graciously and succinctly and, and with great vigor and depth. But um, how's everyone doing here today? Got a couple guys from Fort Lauderdale are down there. Introduce you guys selves. Uh, Steve Shaw, I'm the Assistant Chief with uh, Fort Lauderdale Fire over EMS and training. And I brought with me uh, Battalion Chief Garrett Pingle. He's a partner of mine over here in the, the administrative area. And he's he's space. He lives in the space of uh, basically uh, succession planning and recruitment and retention. And I'll let him introduce himself real quick. How's it going, all? Garrett Pingo, Special Projects Chief. Uh, one of my sixteen hats is the hiring and recruiting, as he said, as well as communications and some other stuff. So excited to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Be a good talk today, I'm sure. 
Perfect. You got uh, Jesse on, Jesse Marcotte. How's it going? Thanks for uh, having me on today. Jesse Marcotte, I work for the Northville Township Fire Department. As a training coordinator, we're located in the uh, Metro Detroit area. We're actually very fortunate to have just hired um, our, our biggest class yet, which the, uh, the recruitment part of that was a fun little um, experience for us. And now we're on to that retention piece and keeping those talented people that we have. Uh, and then also I'm fortunate to uh, be able to learn from Damon and Brian and many other people uh, in the ISFSI and like Brian and Damon serve on the board of directors there as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, as you can tell, we got a, a great cast today uh, and a lot of knowledge on this uh, panel. So let's get right into it. Um, it's no no question in today's fire service. We're, we're facing shorter numbers of people coming into the job. Um, all of us are struggling to get people to apply, uh, to get that same passion on the job that, you know, we had 20 years ago, uh, you know, 30 years ago on the job. Uh, we were getting excited to be on the job and just excited to be in the fire service. We weren't so focused on some of the things that today's firefighters are. Um, so that that said, I, I kind of got some things today and, and just some questions that kind of go around the room is, you know, what are we looking for in today's firefighters? And, you know, you know, Chief Halton was talking about, you know, as, as leaders, it's our job to train these guys to be the future successors of our organization. But as that new recruit, that new firefighter coming on the job, what traits or assets or skills are we looking for in those people? And I think that's important because it's going to parlay into the next question of like, well, then how do we find those people? Right. So, so demand in, in Oakland, you know, you guys are looking for people, you, you, you put out a pool, you guys are hiring, you know, Oakland's the anomaly, right? You get a thousand people to apply for, for two jobs. Um, cause, cause demand Simmons works there, uh, and everyone's worked with demand, but you know, when you, when you get your candidates, you know, what are you looking for in those people? And, and, and chief, that's a, that's, that's a good question. And that has not changed since, um, I, began my journey into the fire service back in 1991. We're looking for young men and women who are committed to serving the community. We're looking for good young men and women who value the team concept. And we're looking for good young men and women who want to learn and serve and set the organization up for success today, tomorrow, and in the future. And that sentiment is probably shared across the entire fire service in regards to what you know, we're not looking for individuals to come in and, and be the next Steve Jobs or Bill Gates in that respect, but <clears throat> men and women who want to serve and give 100% effort each and every day they come into work. Gotcha. All right. I'm going to go to Fort Lauderdale just because it's beautiful down there. <laughs> it is. We, we got an expert on the, on the panel today. So, you know, let's tap into that. So uh, I can tell you, uh, I can reiterate, reiterate the same words, you know, honesty, integrity. We can't teach those things. We look for personnel that are bringing the unteachable measures. We're looking for someone that we can trust to do the right thing when nobody's watching. Uh, that is something that we've lost, I think, in, in our youth today uh, as we see the recruiting I handled internal affairs for three years and uh, so many things I saw of our person, it was always came down to a lack of what was their level of integrity prior. So it's huge. We do a very extensive background to ensure we can validate those people. But, you know, I think one of the biggest things is these, this young generation wants to know there is not the limitation in public service that used to exist. A lot of people, I I think they feel, especially parents I've learned talking to to our youth in the area and, and their parents at schools and such is that they think public service puts a cap on the possibilities of their child's success in life. And that's not the case anymore. It isn't a blue collar job like it used to be. And they need to know that. I mean, this organization I work for has given me so much. It's given me higher education and great opportunity. And it needs to be expressed that way where historically it's not been that uh, for what these this youth parents know about public service. They know a very different picture from 20, 30, 40 years ago. And uh, we have to change that perception to people that it is a career, a career that can lead to other careers. If you put your time in here, you, you're not pigeonholed into simply being a firefighter or a paramedic. You know, how many times do you firefighters raise to the ranks and become city managers uh, or they venture into other organizations? Our, our neighboring city, Pompano Beach Fire Rescue, their fire chief is an attorney, a practicing attorney. Uh, but he started as a tailboard firefighter. 
And I think if we share these stories with the youth that it's a gateway to greater careers because you learn so much about yourself, we're teaching them there's more to currency in what they're gaining than just dollar bills. You know, people look at what value they get out of a career for personal satisfaction, for their family's growth. And those are all components that are, I think are important to express in the recruiting process, but more so once you get them on the job in the first year, explain to them where they can go with your organization and where the service can take them. I'll, I'll say one thing to, yeah. to, to tailor, tailor on to what Garrett's saying, and this is just a, an observation in the two people that have just spoken between Garrett and Demond, uh, I think it's important to note that they said nothing about the skills coming in, the tactics they possess or the past experiences. We can teach them that. We're looking for good people, like with just that good, like I said, the intangibles. We can, we can work with that, those, those good people and teach them everything they need to know. So I think that was just a, a poignant statement that Demond started with. They said nothing about skills, nothing about their on-the-job experience coming in. We got that. It's what kind of person they are. No, I think that's it's huge too because you know, and I want to talk about that the testing process, right? So, like here in a minute, we'll we'll get into that question of like we know what we're looking for, but is our process failing us because we're we're trying to capture that great medic or that great firefighter versus that good human? Um, but I think you guys are right on the ball there and stuff. And and you know, I, I think it's great too. You guys talk about team player and the trainable person, but Jesse, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking that is beautiful Metro Detroit too. So I'm surprised that you'd go to Fort Lauderdale before your your brothers in the Midwest here. But uh, with that being said, this is a hard this is a, another um, hard one to follow because I think we just hit that like right on the head in terms of hiring good people. Um, so one thing that plays hand in hand with recruitment and retention is culture, which I'm sure we could have our own discussion on on just fire service culture and, and the impact of that on recruitment and retention. Um, but in our organization, we really had to drill down on this and figure out what we wanted or what we were looking for, right? So the concept of adapting of adapting and evolving and what that led us to is uh, is a concept, hire for character, train for skill. And, um, and getting the right person is more important than getting the right skill set. So that relationship between those hard skills and those soft skills um, is super important for us. And we, we kind of tie that up into a a concept that's referred to as the whole man or the whole person, depending on where you're reading that um, concept from. We want somebody well-rounded. We want um, somebody who's well-rounded mentally, physically, and emotionally to be a good part of a uh, great team. And that's really what we're talking about. Um, furthermore, the way that we, we do everything, the three qualities that we try to measure in that interview process or, or throughout that process um, are the things that we think make people successful throughout their career not just at the beginning. So we refer to that as IAP, Initiative Attitude Performance. Um, so we want people that show initiative, are willing to be involved, right? And then have a good attitude, they're open-minded. Um, and then ultimately the performance piece comes with time. That's a trust the process, uh, that is the trust the process part of the equation. So just like everybody else has said, we look for good people first, hire for character, train for skill, initiative, attitude, performance. All right, I got to go to to Bobby and Glenn here and ask them the question of, so we know we're looking for, and you guys are got to get the professor in there first. No, absolutely, and that's so. I, I guess for you guys, because you guys have been in this longer than than all of us on this panel. Well, are you yeah. inferring that we're old? No, it's it, it's seasoned. It's seasoned. Oh, I am old. old. I'm, no, I'm just flat out old. old. It's, it's all right. So, so why do you guys think that? It's like you guys have seen, you know, generations of fire service and, and you know, you guys have been leaders at, at your departments and, and just in the industry as a whole. Why are we seeing less people joining the fire service? Why, why do you think that? Well, well, what's, what, what's that crux? Well, um, at least from my perspective, again, I'm actually, when I was in Austin, San Antonio, I was working in fire prevention as an engineer and stuff. So, um, you know, for example, when I worked down there in both those places, they had a line out the door for uh, for recruitment. I mean, again, that was the 90s. Uh, things are different today. But I, one pothole I want to throw into this, uh, this discussion is civil service. Um, civil service in a lot of places is a determining factor on who you end up hiring. Um, you know, they've got to go through a physical exam. They have to take a, a written exam and most often take some type of psychological exam, but that's it. And you really don't have a lot of latitude um, in that sense. I, you know, and I guess that's a question is maybe for you guys to think about, um, you know, is civil service 
still relevant. Uh, we all know that civil service came about over 100 years ago to try to deal with issues of you know, patronage and nepotism and all those kind of things. But on the other hand, it, it really does limit you to what you do. And, you know, so I think, you know, from, in a, from a volunteer perspective, um, you know, we're, we're hoping to get, you know, people standing upright and still have a heartbeat walking in the door for the most part. So it's, it's tough. It's tough all the way around. And I think, you know, I, I can certainly agree that integrity is one of the most important things you look at when a person comes in, because that's going to dictate how they act later on in their career, basically. But um, anyway, I just I, again, I don't want to throw a monkey wrench into this, but, but it is a, it is a big thing for law, particularly larger departments and stuff is you've got to contend with that and, um, you know, that kind of issue. So I know what your thoughts are. Go ahead, Bobby. Well, and I'll dovetail, you know, although we have civil service requirements in many cities, it's one of the many filters that people go through, right? There's CPAP, physical agility. So there's a series of filters that kind of gets us to the persons that we can select from. And I think when we're doing that, to your point, why are we seeing less? I think two things. I'm a big fan of micro, dirty jobs. You know, I, I think that, um, and, and people often look askant on some of those professions because they don't know what they're looking at, right? Uh, they see a plumber, working on a plumbing deal. And they think, well, how tough is that? Well, for those of us that have screwed up many of the DIY plumbing things in our homes, you know, we know it's really hard, okay. you know, or, or they really are watching yeah. an electrician right. and, and you get the bill and it's 600 bucks. And you're like, well, all the guy I did was that. I could have done that. <laughs> yeah, no, you couldn't. No, your house is burned out. Yeah. So, so there's that aspect, right? We've kind of devalued the worker in some ways. And when people look at firefighting, they fail to see all the nuance inside of it. And I think I think part of that, and if we're gonna look for who, who we should be looking for, we're, we have to remember two things. We're not hiring for the Emanuel Kant Society, you know, where you can never tell a lie, that kind of thing, right? Or the Sisters of the Rosary. We're not, we're not looking, we're not recruiting for those organizations. So we have to be careful about what questions we ask. Like remember question 17, you know, we all lied on question 17, I, I can prove it. How many of you guys said no on question 17? Have you ever smoked marijuana? You all said no. I said no. I was lying. You know, hell, I think I had a joint in my pocket when I said that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I mean, back in the day, we actually asked that question. I don't know how you ask it today. But all I'm saying is, is that sometimes we create artificial barriers to entry that don't need to be there. There was a young fellow who went for interview after interview. He started off in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He got rejected. He went to another department in Colorado, got rejected, went down the road, got rejected because he was too short. He continually, he got to Phoenix, Arizona. A nurse gave him that extra inch he didn't have. That man was Alan Brunacini. Yeah. He was technically too short to be a Phoenix Fire Department yeah. employee when he got the job. So I think we should look for the curious. We should look for the bold and the adventurous. And I think we should take a page out of some of our friends like the Navy. You know, it's an adventure. Because being a firefighter really is an adventure. And if you want to hire a squared away cat, you know, you hire a former naval officer because they're squared away cats. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you hire, you, you look at somebody's resume. If they were, if they were a, 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 a chief petty officer, hire that person. She, he or she knows what they, they know how to lead, right? They know how to, they know how to work independently, solve problems. So I think curiosity, we need to do more to develop that curiosity about what it is we do. The, and it's okay to talk about the fire service romantically. It really is. I mean, people criticize me often for being a cheerleader for the fire service, but I, I find that to be a compliment. I think what we do is incredibly amazing. And to the chief's point, it, it really is a career that has the opportunity to take you, you know, we'll hire you with a high school education. And that's as far as you want to go educationally. You can make it to chief of the department with that if you want. Or you can work with a fellow with a PhD. We all know firefighters with their PhDs. Uh, Reggie has his PhD. Uh, uh, you know, I have a dozen friends that they've got their doctorate. So we were we were down at the Rock the other day. Two guys were dentists. There was a gal who had a she was a, a lawyer or something. She was some kind of some kind of law related. But they could be at any Fortune 500 company. They could have a firm practice. The point is. I don't know that we should be concerned about recruitment numbers being down. I think we should be concerned about the quality of the people who are showing up that we're recruiting from. People just have more choices today than they did in the past. 
And, and that's a good thing. And I, and I think we should be more selective and not less selective. I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be a member of any club that would have me, to quote the great Groucho Marx. Um, so this is my thoughts. But, but again, I think that civil service is one filter that we use. Physical agility is another filter that we use. Criminal record, obviously, you know, in some places we use it, in some places we don't. And, and I'm on the, I'm agnostic about that too. As long as you haven't killed somebody, I'm pretty much okay with it. Or unless it was somebody that needed to be killed. <laughs> it's a joke. But you know what I mean? I think even there, we need to be careful. What were they arrested for? If it was a felony DWI or something, and they've been sober for 10 years or five years, I think we can get past that. You know what I mean? Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And let me just add one last point. Um, and again, this is this is what I hear from various folks uh, across the country. Is, is there a sense out there that the, the folks that are coming onto the departments today are see this as, as a job as opposed to an adventure, okay? I think that's maybe at the center of this, that, you know, the folks coming in today, you know, grew up in an era of having email, having so, social media, all those kind of things. Is this more of a job to them? Is that the way they see it? Or is this, I guess, are there still folks coming in that, you know, wanted to do this for a long time, wanted to actually be part of an adventure, basically? And maybe that's part of the part of your discussion about what, what, how do you tailor sort of carrots out there to grab people? I mean, do you, do you describe the job as an adventure to folks? So, yeah, I think that's I, I, I completely agree. I think when you see people that come in that, you know, either had like like legacy members where their parents or their brother or someone in the fire service. And, and so they know the job, right? They know what this is all about. It's not just coming in and clocking in and clocking out. It's a passion. It's and to your point of you know, it, they understand it. And I think for us, and I'll, you know, there's, I do a poor job probably of explaining what that is, right? Like what, why this job is everything, why this job is so important and so awesome. And, and to your point of uh, an incredible adventure. And I think, you know, Chief Hall's point too is, you know, we're, we don't, we shouldn't be concerned with our numbers being low. It should be more about like, we want the right people. And, you know, if we're looking for the right people and we're doing these events, you know, either recruiting drives or we're, we're trying to get people to say, Hey, listen, yeah, you can go work in an office, but do you really want to sit behind a desk all day long and type on a computer? Or do you want to be around a team all, all throughout high school, all throughout college, you played football. Wouldn't you like to have that for the rest of your life in a team atmosphere? You know, that's in my head, like the, at least how I'm thinking of how can I recruit these people? Cause to your point, you know, nobody joins the Navy SEALs thinking I want to be a Navy SEAL because I'm going to get rich being a Navy SEAL. No, I'm going to do a Navy SEAL because Navy SEALs do really cool stuff. And I think as the fire service, and firefighters and fire service leaders, we need to remind people like, hey, this is really cool stuff that we're able to do. I mean, you know, you look at the tools and the, the, the equipment we have and the, the jobs we go on, nobody else gets to do that stuff, you know. And so I think the recruiting part of that, I think we just need to get that message back out. And I think because fires, quote unquote, are down, we all dog ourselves and say, well, yeah, we're not going on as many fires. And, and you know the job's boring, and we're not doing things. It's like no, we're we're making the job what we want it to be, and I think those opportunities still exist for us to make this job really fun and really cool, and and still have a ton of fun at the firehouse, which I want to do. And and, and chief, if I can interject for a yeah. second, as we're having this discussion, we talked about the spoil system and that segue into civil service, and we're talking about artificial barriers. Um, Two points, and, and, and this this next point, this is near and dear to me, and um, I may get in some trouble down the road by saying this, but it has to be stated, stated, is that, and I see this in California, is that a lot of organizations and what they're doing, they're hiring lateral firefighters. And we talk about this shortage of firefighters. Well, if everyone is hiring lateral firefighters, all we're doing is just moving the individuals from one organization to the next. And when I first came in, came on a job, it was entry level positions. And how do you increase the number of firefighters if all you're doing is hiring laterals? It makes no sense. So to the fire chiefs out there that are, that are on this, that are listening now or will be listening, we have to, I'm not gonna say think outside the box because this is not some concept that that um, was constructed in the ivory tower. We gotta give young men and women that first chance. 
McDonald's gave me the first chance back in 1989 to flip burgers. They weren't hiring lateral burger makers and probably are not doing that today. We have to do that. And then number two, none of us know the true reason as to why recruitment numbers are down. But what we need to start doing, and I see it here in the comment here, is that we call it that K through career pipeline. And no, we're not going to go into kindergarten schools and start saying, hey, you want to be a firefighter today? A five or six year old, he or she does not know what they want to do. But definitely by the time we reach the high school level, we have to start introducing this career to them and all the benefits that come to being a professional firefighter. Once we start doing that, we're gonna see our numbers increase because the young men and women that are coming into the fire service today, they're smart, they wanna learn, they wanna give back. And it's up to us to make sure that we create that environment where they see this as a career, number one. And number two, that that sense of entitlement is not there. Jesse, what do you got? When I when default and described it as an adventure, that got me thinking. Um, that's exactly what we have been describing it as during our recruiting events is it's a choose your own adventure. And um, we we were talking briefly earlier, I think Chief Halton also mentioned hiring leaders and embracing leadership. And uh, I was talking to our, our newest members yesterday, they're in, in, in a six week recruit academy, even though they're all certified kind of thing. Um, but we were talking about this very webinar yesterday. And uh, one of the things they mentioned is leadership and that they feel like there's a, a, a very much an onus on leadership and having those skills. But when they get hired at various departments, they feel like they're kind of put in a box. And when I, when I refer to as choose your own adventure, one of the things that we're really trying to incubate is those interests in those other opportunities. Um, so I want people to focus on opportunity more so than promotion. And those opportunities lead to things down the road, such as promotion, um, and also that different level of, of career fulfillment. But our, just our little department, we're, we're a small little suburban department in Metro Detroit. Um, Sometimes the things you do surprise you. So we, uh, when we were developing our recruiting pitch, we came up with all of the different special assignments and opportunities somebody could have in our small department. And there's over 50. Um, so we wanna get these people in and we don't want them to wait 20 years to be on our safety committee or our apparatus committee or serve as a mentor with our probationary firefighter training program. We wanna get these people in immediately. Um, and we also don't wanna like cast aside everybody else on an apartment. That's not what I'm saying saying that we wanna keep that, we don't wanna say, hey, you were so great, you were so smart and you had all these great things, but for the next 10 years, just sit in the corner over there. We wanna get involvement immediately. Um, and the way we describe it is choose your own adventure. Um, it, you will get out um, what you want to get out of this profession because there are so many different things that you can pursue from fire prevention to training to operations, EMS and everything in between. So I, I want to tap into what, what Glenn was saying about the civil service test. I think that was I think that's an interesting component of it because everything we've said so far is has nothing to do with the people we're looking for. We can train somebody to be a firefighter. We can train somebody to do the EMS component of this. We can train. I mean, you look at it. Nobody comes in with all the tech rescue skills. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. But we train those people to be tech rescue and, and USAR and all that stuff. So so we we know that people are trainable, but yet our testing is that civil service test. So, you know, down in Fort Lauderdale, what are you guys doing for testing to make sure, you know, for the initial test? So the guy comes in, guy or gal comes in off the street and says, hey, I want to be a firefighter, paramedic, firefighter EMT with Fort Lauderdale. What's that test look like or that process? So we've really been aggressive over the last few years changing that platform. We identified barriers to applicants. Um, everybody's seeing a drop in applicant numbers. We hire fully certified firefighter paramedics. So that poses a challenge off the bat. These people must commit to two years of school prior to even getting a job in our South Florida job market. And then we put them through a Tim Week Academy once they get here and then a one-year probation. So we were seeing numbers when I first took over hiring four years ago, between 150 to 200 applicants for a job. And we would be hiring anywhere between 10 to 25 personnel. Neighboring agencies seeing similar numbers and then the numbers started to drop dramatically in our area. Uh, our most recent process, we had 100 applicants 
And believe it or not, that's good because our neighboring agency got 40 for the exact same job. Uh, we have different testing strategies than they have. So for example, when I first took over, they had to submit a local physical ability test from a local fire academy. You can only get here in our county. They had to submit all their certifications ahead of time. And there was a laundry list of things just to get a test. So we really dumbed it down and streamlined it. What is the bare minimum to allow you to apply? And what we found that did is it overcame the challenges of a candidate that saw the job posting last minute. So, you know, the way we used to do it, if you didn't have a six week notice, you weren't getting the stuff together. We're talking driver's license records and high school records and transcripts and so many variables that if you were not given the inside information that was coming out, you were not going to get it done in time. And if you lived in Tampa or Orlando when we're trying to relocate to South Florida, just to apply, you had to come down for a weekend to take a physical ability test at a private academy and turn the credential in. So we got rid of all of that. Now it's simply an application, a high school diploma, whatever certifications you have, we require a minimum of an EMT that can become a medic prior to being hired. And then they take a fire team's test. Uh, they come in and we give it in person at our city hall. We're moving forward with the program of doing it remotely. So we've identified that a candidate living, say, across the state that wants to move to Florida and be a firefighter first time here, what barriers? Well, driving down to take a written examination with no guarantee of employment, then driving down two weeks later for an interview. At what point does a candidate say it's not worth all this effort for a possibility of a job? So we want to make it where they take their fire team's entrance level test remotely proctored online or at a testing center. And we're even considering allowing the interview, which we score to be done video based. So a candidate who works a full-time job and has a family and can't afford to take two days off work to come to Fort Lauderdale at 10 o'clock at night can go on their computer, take their video-based written examination, take their video-based interview, submit, and then we can stream on our reviewing process and make a rankings list. So that's just one thing we've done to streamline the front end of the, of the list. And we've also really found we lose candidates in the process if the process takes too long. So we aggressively shortened up our background investigative process by moving it up way earlier in the application process. So timelines are important. Availability to apply is important. Everything is done online. There's nothing submitted in person anymore, ever. Uh, and we wanna move to as much being done prior to coming to our city. You know, the first time you come here, I want it to be a follow-up interview where there's a chance for a job offer. And if we believe we can get to that point where your travel here may result in you leaving with a ticket saying you got a job, then we've succeeded in streamlining our process. No, I think it's interesting. You know, I, I, I definitely think, um, I was thinking of our process. So like, you know, we, we are, we're very strong on the medic portion of it, you know, and, and I just, I think to myself like, well, the person's coming in, you know, typically they, they have to be a paramedic. Um, they have to be a certified firefighter. We'll send some people to the Academy, but it, you know, it's on a specialist case scenario. Yeah, we test so hard on that, right? We test hard to make sure that they're a quality medic and they don't have a chance to get to the actual interview to talk about how who they are as a person unless they pass all that stuff. And I think to myself, not, not downplaying the EMS aspect or the fire aspect, but to your point, we can train somebody to be a better paramedic, correct? But we can't train somebody to be a good person or how to communicate with people or, or how to hold them to control themselves. And that's the very last component of the process, probably not just for myself, but for a lot of individuals and so are a lot of organizations that say, so is that part of the, the mark that we're missing is, is, you know, we say we can train people, yet we test you at such a high level to show that you've accomplished what you already had in certifications. And we, so, we abandoned that. Sorry, I got you. No, go ahead, please. And, and I said, we, we abandoned that process years and years ago. We used to have a mega code. They come in and after doing their basic entry, still have to perform. Well, at that point, you're now holding the candidate accountable for the quality of their instructor. You know, did the instructor prepare them? Where we know we can prepare them. We have world-class instructors that work in our organization, guys that were at ground zero on the day the towers fell. I mean, we have people that have been through things and can share real life experiences. So our entrance exam is completely uh, about who you are as a person, uh, interpersonal questions, where your values come out in the questioning, basic mechanical, mechanical aptitude questions, 
And then they go to an interview and the interview is weighed as much as the written. So they come in and answer questions about who they are, integrity, what was their life. Nothing is about their skills. They get asked zero fire ground questions. They get asked zero medical questions. We'll teach you that. So two things I just want to say. <clears throat> thank you to our friends on Facebook who are sending us. If you look in the chat, fellas, you'll see the Facebook messages that we're getting. Um, thank you, Jimmy Brown, a lot of other folks talking about there. If you're on Facebook following that conversation about uh, programs that they're doing in the high schools and uh, uh, apprentice programs and uh, um, really, really great stuff. Uh, Garrett, I would I would love to see an article from you about what you've done. Seriously, because Glenn whispered in my ear, we need an article from this guy because he's thought it out so much. I mean, what so, you if we can capture so. that in writing, it's pure gold, right? And 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 the thing about writing it up, it'll help you and it'll help thousands of other people who are doing what you're yeah, doing. That's the point. Yeah, so that, it's that, it's that's the point. It's your lessons learned about what you what you just told us, basically. Right. We would appreciate it. So if you don't do it, you'll never be back on this program. And and yeah. if you and if you don't do it, I happen to be good friends with your chief. So I'll just make a phone call and, and I'm just kidding. We're kidding. We're kidding. But but I would I would love to see it in writing, honestly. The other so one quick thing anecdotally that we used to do that I used to do with my friend, my good old friend, Alan Bernasini, if I had time or I was in the area, he would let me know when they had like one of the cattle calls, you know, like to pick up your paperwork. And uh, they, they did like a um, we called it a cattle call. Um, it was like the orientation, orientation meeting, like you had to come. It was prior to all this stuff, but you had to physically come and you got a packet you had to fill out and told you what the process would be. They schedule your this test and that test and all that good stuff. So what I would do for Alan was nobody knew me from Adam and he would do it for me occasionally, but everybody knew him. And he was too identifiable. But in Phoenix, I could walk down the hallway. And when I walk down the hallway, I, I talk to people in elevators. I'm that guy. You know, I've never met a stranger. And, and, and I like because I love people. So I'd like smile at the kid. And if the kid didn't smile back at me, they were watching the, the Phoenix evaluators in the crowd. So like they would see how the kid reacted to somebody walking up to him or if I had a, I would say, Hey, does anybody know, you know, and the kid that would come forward first and say, Oh yeah, sure. Mister. You know, if you go down that hallway there, there's a, there's a water fountain or there's a bathroom or whatever. Right. So that, and then they would notice that about that fire, that person that they stepped up, you know what I mean? They, they came forward, they smiled back. They said, good morning, sir. Or something like that. Right. Or the kid you didn't want was the kid who you said, anyway, start looking at the ground, right? Because that person is not, you know what I mean? They're they're not interested in other people. Well, that's the home of Mrs. Smith, right? So that's why. Well, and it was the home of Mrs. Smith and it was all about customer service. So, right. so that's one side of it. But I think that, you know, everything you said was interesting and Glenn and I were sidebarring on the moment here. I think it's important at some level that applicants have skin in the game, right? Like, to your point, they just saw the ad back in the day. They saw the ad, went down, took the civil service, you know, took the test and, and you know, got hired. The, those people don't tend to last very long. The other people who don't last very long, which is interesting, is the people who go through, as Garrett was pointing out, brutally long, it, it, arduous processes. They just, they, they, you know, they become frustrated, right? So there, there's some studies that the United States military is doing now about the longevity of what they are called ring knockers, you know, the guys with the big academy rings and the guys who went through NROTC or officer's candidate school to see, you know, how they do longevity wise. Now, clearly being a ring knocker, whether it's West Point, Air Force Academy, Naval Academy is better in terms of your long term projection just because of the networking. Right. But in terms of just staying in the service, they, they see like if, if the person's just in, say, in aviation or, or surface warfare or whatever, they, they tend to stay at, at longer than the people who don't. So there's always it, we're always going to be evolving on how we look at this. Um, but I love the stuff that I'm seeing online that people are putting up about, you know, training young people and, and reaching out, you know, before they're even eligible to be a firefighter. And, and so they're building that, you know, curiosity or that interest. And, and hey, they might they might start looking at us and end up being law enforcement. Or they might start looking at us and end up becoming a teacher where they might start looking at us and say, hey, I really like this. I want to do it, but only as a volunteer. And then I'm going to be an investment banker or whatever. You know what I mean? They, they might not want to do it full time like we do. 
You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and really, to Jesse's point, much like you guys use Fort Lauderdale, who doesn't want to be in outside of Detroit off of Lake Michigan in February or January at two in the morning in a blizzard throwing water? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, it's you know, saying to get yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, Garrett down there saying he'd be bringing his surfboard with his wax <laughs> on it and everything. You know, you know he'd be the, the, the surf's up, baby. <laughs> Jesse, I love that. that. That was the line of the day, man. Hey, how come you didn't come to me first? And you're talking about places to it's be. True. It's true. We're the Great Lakes State. You're the Great Lakes State. Yeah. 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 You can walk. <laughs> you don't even have to be Jesus to walk across it. <laughs> you can go south to Canada. So. <laughs> That's going to be on our next recruitment flyer. Well, out the kid, I love it. Yeah, I, it's funny. I was reading the comments on the Facebook chat, and you know, the honest truth here is, you know, I started at fifteen as a junior firefighter in a department, and that's how I got my start. And you know, look at me, you know, now not you know nothing, but it's you know, I I just knew early on that's like, hey, this is a cool job, and you know, something I could probably pursue. And and you don't see a lot of that anymore. You know, a lot of places because of liability or, or you know questions or you know, guys just like, ah, I don't want to deal with that. Um, it's gotten away from that. And so I think that's a, a huge aspect. And thanks for the people on Facebook for, for chiming in with those, uh, those comments. Cause I think that's a valuable part of this. Jesse, what do you got? Yeah. Yeah. I was actually going to say the same thing. This is, uh, my original fire coat here it says EXP because we had an explorer post. So same thing. I knew nothing about the fire service. This was, uh, in the, in the nineties as well, but long story short, um, that cadet program was was really helpful. I was in that uh, cadet program, knew immediately that's what I was going to do. My sister was in that cadet program. She's in the fire service also. But I think when times were good, especially like post, when I say times were good in terms of the quantity of, of sheer uh, people who were interested in this profession, I think those things that we were doing po pre 9-11, um, a lot of those programs went away post 9-11 because there were so many people who were interested in this field and i think at some point unfortunately those cadet programs either became the forgotten about um component of our recruiting or frankly it just became a burden um and and that's unfortunate i think that's maybe where we've failed to meet the mark a little bit as uh, fire service leaders in terms of getting those programs back um front and center and there's a number in michigan who have uh, who have developed relationships with community schools or either or or have created their own cadet program um, in high school as well but for the most part we don't see that level of engagement that we saw previously um and again there's a number of reasons for that especially you know once the once the recession happened not only did we lose a lot of of contractual benefits um in our in our occupation but we lost a lot of that senior leadership as well and it took a while to build that back i feel like um so now we're trying to come up with ways that are innovative, which in, in got kind of like bell bottoms, what goes out of style comes back in style. These cadet programs are, are super important and, uh, and super useful. So um, the last thing I'll say about that too is, to my surprise, when I was 15 and told my high school guidance counselor that I wanted to be a firefighter, um, most people had me pegged as a brain surgeon or astronaut. But aside from that, those two professions Total kidding aside, uh, I was never going to be either one of those two things. But my guidance counselor told me, why don't you pick a real job? And that was unfortunate. And that was a relationship that didn't exist then and probably doesn't exist now in terms of informing the people within our school system what, what this career field looks like and the things that we can offer um, prospective members of our industry, right? Um, and, and the recruitment and retention piece of the, the people that we just hired, they all have team sports backgrounds. It's not hard to identify, um, in this instance, what their common factors are as a group. But we've talked to zero sports teams um, in our school system. These are all opportunities. I'm not trying to identify weaknesses for the sake of identifying problems, but for the sake of identifying very easy solutions, meeting with high school guidance counselors and uh, in, in groups such as sports teams, or even the robotics club or something to that effect where people enjoy coming together for a, a greater purpose. No, I, I totally agree. I, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier too, was a, a great comment was a lot of people saw to your point of, you know, get a real job is, you know, the fire service was where if you couldn't find anything else to do, you wouldn't become a firefighter. And, you know, I, I think Florida, you know, one of your former fire chiefs is now either a state or U S Senator or something down there. Um, 
So, you know, it was, uh, it's, it's not a dead end job. It's, you know, the possibilities are endless. And you look at people that have, that are in the fire service, you know, to where they're working now, to the, the things they're doing, um, you know, it, it can go to wherever you want it to go. Uh, I got one of those in my office too, Chief Halton. That's how I do my online classes. So I don't have to, they never That's know the, I've left the room. You got the Jesse mustache going on that thing. <laughs> Jesse, if you wanna if you wanna bring those bell bottoms down here, I mean we got disco lights. Look at that. People, this is why we're so successful in recruiting. You guys so got disco, the, the disco light thing is kind of off putting. I guess we'll be honest. Down and check it out, you know. So <laughs> um, I, I did want to say in regards to the schools, I, I do think we have to partner better with the schools. In our region, we do have it where the high school programs they can graduate as an EMT. If they're 18, they get the ride-alongs done. They can finish our Explorer program as a firefighter one and simply have to go take the six weeks to become a firefighter two. And it's very realistic for young men and women to be EMT firefighter certified before their 19th birthday. And it's it's school-based and such. But the sad thing is, is that we don't, as, as a service, network as well with our public schools as we should. So we recently had our annual Fire Chiefs Association of Broward County Awards Luncheon, and every year they award scholarships to local students that qualify. We couldn't give it away this year. We had one applicant, and they didn't qualify. And I ask myself, where are the school guidance counselors looking for these scholarships and pushing it out? Or is it our responsibility that we're not properly advocating to those working groups that the, the scholarships are available? And just to me, it just seems like, how did we miss that type of mark that we couldn't give away a scholarship that we've had success giving away in the past? And it's it's a full paid academy um, and there was no applicants. And you're talking, you know, tens of thousands of graduating students in the Broward and Dade County's area, if not more, and we couldn't give away one scholarship. So whose fault is that? I think we have obligation there. We have obligation to break down barriers, whether those barriers are gender-based or racial-based, um, cultural-based. We have to break those barriers down. And that's been part of our process as well. You know, in South Florida, you have to be able to swim to be a firefighter. Well, not everybody learns how to swim as a child. We offer swim lessons to our candidates before they have to become a firefighter. So they hit the ground running when they start. It's a requirement to have a swim card with us to get the job. When you apply, if you say you can't swim, we have lifeguards teach you how to swim. Like we have to sometimes uh, give the olive branch and yes, they want, but they should have skin in the game, but our candidates do. They're firefighter paramedic certified. They got two years of skin in the game. I'm willing to meet them in the middle. We are willing to meet in the middle and say, you're a value to us. You've put in the effort. Let us show you the effort. Um, to the point that every time our candidates come and take their entrance test, I show up at every single test to greet 20 candidates at a time and set the expectations of our relationship and commitment to them and what I expect from them to us. And it's been a great success. And we're talking, you know, I'll go to seven, eight tests over a three week period, spend 15 minutes and set a good, I know, I know I got to write something. I'm going to stop giving myself work now. <laughs> so, yeah, I was actually going to say, Gary, if you could have that out by January, I could really do that for next year. It'd be fantastic. Oh. We're going to February issue now, right now. Now, so. I, now I am calling your chief. <laughs> yeah. I'm, a little, I'm a little busy this week and next week. There's something important here, but maybe I can jump on it after that. <laughs> Fantastic. Exactly. What, All right. We've, we've been last, going right on. What's that? No, I was going to say one last thing. And yeah. um, he and I come from the day of uh, the days of emergency. And I can't tell you how many people of our era talk about that TV show as being sort of a motivator to get involved, particularly, I think, on the EMS side of things, but also firefighters as well. And we think about think about the shows that are out there today, like Chicago Fire, that really, you know, is as bad as close as, of course, as you can come, uh, given the limitations of cinema and things like that. But that's, a you know, those programs, I think, are very uh, influential to people. Let's put it that way. And maybe there's a way that we can sort of capitalize on that to get people's interest. Cause it, again, it is the adventure. Gee, I want to be one of those people, you know, that kind of thing. So, so I, food for thought. That's a great idea. And that is true. I mean, you look at what top gun did for the Navy recruiting and uh, oddly enough, the Navy before world war II never asked guys if they could swim and, and you'd be amazed at, no seriously, how many sailors drowned because they yeah, couldn't swim right. yeah. at Pearl Harbor 
at least a dozen or more drowned because they just couldn't swim. And, it's the anniversary uh, today. The anniversary today, 80, 81, 81 years, yeah, yeah. Date which will live in, live in infamy. But the um, to, to, to Glenn's point, skin in the game, when you have firefighter, you have firefighter and a paramedic license, that's skin in the game on steroids. That's pretty, that's phenomenal. But to, to Garrett's point, though, that's the standard of care that that's that's what people in Florida expect from their firefighter paramedics. They expect them to be Johnny and Roy. I mean, they really that 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 is a that there's there is there's no equivocating on that as far as the customer service side of it goes. And that's true, really, kind of west of the Missouri, uh, by and large, in the lower states in particular. If you go if you're in Texas or uh, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, California. Uh, uh, People expect you to be a firefighter paramedic. Period. They, they they don't they don't. There's no there's no gray area. And I know there's still some eastern fire departments that are very fire centric and they don't have that that embrace yet. But I think it's just part of that evolution. And a lot of that education can also be streamlined into our you know secondary schools, our high schools. There's no reason why you know paramedical level or EMT level training couldn't. Be be part of a, a high school curricula because those skill sets transcend anything else you're going to do in life. If you know how to do, you know, basic first aid and you're walking through the mall or you're on vacation with your family and someone suffers a medical emergency or, you know, or falls or whatever, knowing the right thing to do is invaluable. So, you know, it's important training irrespective of if you become a, a firefighter or a cop or, you know, or, or someone in, in a direct intervention, you know, service level. So, I think that those are the kinds of things that when we talk about what's going on with our schools, if you're a member of a school board, and many firefighters are on their local school boards, classes like EMT, why, why don't we have an EMT program that's available as an alternative for, for kids? And I don't think, and I'm, I've, got a, I've, I've got my college degree, I'm not anti-higher education, but it's not for everybody. And, and I think that there's an important message to be sent about the caliber the intelligence, the Integrity. skill, right, right of, of the men and women in the fire service, irrespective of their level of formal education. Right. Uh, as Americans, we fell in love with the idea that everybody had to go to college, you know, for whatever reason. And, and, and that's just not true. Everybody doesn't need to go to college. Steve Jobs didn't go to college. I don't think Gates ever finished college. Um, so not everybody has to go to college. Some of the most educated people I know never went to college. My mom never finished grammar school. She ended up taking care of her kids. And she was uh, Bill Grace, the guy Grace Industries. Mm -hmm. She was his personal secretary. So intelligence, capability, and skill is not always the result of academia. Uh, and, and, and your relevance to society is certainly not predicated by academia. And I'm a huge fan of, of people who pursue academia for the right reasons. Right. But if you're just looking at to get the paper Lincoln, right, right. then then that that's problematic. Right. But I think to to the point, um, I, I think we could we got one from oh Bill Car of all people Bill Carey. If you're not if you're not following uh, uh, data not drama, uh, my great friend Bill Carey from up in the D.C. area, he says his wife, a guidance counselor, would say it's the, it's the fire uh, it's the fire department's responsibility. Unlike a teacher who may have a classroom number of students, guidance counselors have the whole student body. They're stretched from covering everything from college career readiness to behavioral and home problems. Make the introduction yourself and make yourself known. Great point. You know, not, it's not up to the school. We need to go to the schools and tell them, hey, we're willing to, you know, I'm not going to Fort Lauderdale or North Metro or, you know, wherever, Richfield. We should go to the school and say, we'll, we'll supply with instructors. We'll help kids. We'll become an asset to the school. That, that's a great idea. Thank you, Bill. As always, d data, not drama. Uh, if you're not following Bill, get on it. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. There you go. All right. Well, we've been going right at about an hour. So we'll wrap this thing up with some final thoughts from everybody. Uh, Jesse, what are your final thoughts on this? It's been a great discussion. I think we've uh, we got some different things. and I'll kind of wrap this up. But what do you think of Jesse? What I'm thinking here is uh, from the recruitment end of things, back to those artificial barriers, knowing what you're looking for and how to assess that. One of my uh, one of my favorite slash least favorite um, artificial barriers is the bag of tools test. 
uh, where we find somebody, we dump an old bag of tools out. It reminds me of uh, if you can dodge a ball, you can dodge a wrench in terms of em literally emptying a bag of old tools on the desk and saying, um, find the find the drill, find the circular saw, find this, find that. And I think all we're measuring at that point really is is what they can do with that tool at that moment in time versus what they, the, the you know, the qualities they have as a person and what can, that can do for us over a period of time. So I think that's one artificial barrier that unfortunately still exists in, in our area here. Um, and then from the retention standpoint of things, um, somebody told me once that it was a lot harder to leave a family than it is to leave a job, right? And I, I think when you throw in what training can do for a new person, one thing that, that we really hold in a very high esteem um, in our department is our mentoring and coaching program. So really right out of the gate, these people, our newest hires are assigned to um, a, a member of our department who could have been there for one year or they could be there for 20 years. Um, it's, it's, it kind of crosses that spectrum arranges through the whole spectrum but it builds that family connection immediately it it gives them somebody that they trust somebody who's an advocate for them and somebody to help build that bridge to the point where if the person didn't know how to use an impact driver which if everybody thought how many times you could probably count them on your hand how many times you you've used an impact driver over 20 years in the fire service that's not our most go-to skill but the point is that person can ultimately be that bridge builder for them so if, if the help they need is with an impact driver or the help they need is throwing ground ladders or just being a better teammate, that's that mentoring and coaching piece. And I do believe that that has a lot of value with respect to retention once we get those quality people in the door. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. And uh, no, the ice of a side, if you remember, we do have a mentoring program that we can lead you to a uh, fire service member in another area and, and get you hooked up. So it's a great program. We will go next. And that's about to open again. Yeah, it's about to be get open again here. So uh, we'll go down to Fort Lauderdale to the newest fire engineering author, Garrett. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so <laughs> in regard to Mr. Carey's comment, I totally agree. It is it is the fire department's responsibility. The, the councils are spread thin. And if they're not in the know of what we have, then that, that's on us. I do want to share a story. Uh, it's a little bit about, I think, branding. I think it's important in the recruitment process that we brand ourselves to people. And there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, in the interview process, as we do here, we have so many times asked the candidates, why Fort Lauderdale? And resoundingly, the answer has been, when I did my paramedic ride times in your organization, your personnel treated me like a family. And it made me want to come here. And it's identifying that your firefighters are your best recruiters in their daily lives and daily activities. And I know when I was a young firefighter, I spent the first 15 years of my career only hanging out with firefighters. So who am I going to recruit? But as I've gotten older and you diversify your friendships and relationships, you start talking to the children of the people that you know as adults, and then it, it grows. But in the firehouses, in regards to those that are already looking for a job, your people need to know in your organization that you're the face 24-7, 365. Talk to your students, talk to kids in the community, be engaged. And then you build relationships. We recently hired a firefighter from a neighboring agency, and his main reason for coming here is he felt that it wasn't a brand, that he was literally going to a job. And that's sad in the fire service when somebody feels that way. And he was there for over five years and made a decision to change to Fort Lauderdale because of the image we present to our to the public and to other firefighters about what we do and who we are. And it goes to Jesse's point as it's hard to leave a family. And if you express that to people and let them know that it's not just a line or a sticker on a truck, then you're probably going to get some good results from it. I listen. How do I follow that up? This is why I bring this guy around. This day, <laughs> I knew this is he was going to be the perfect person to respond to some of the questions that were going to be coming up today. I, I also I'll leave it with this couple of my two thoughts, and they have to go with Jesse's comments. I, I love your hope of your comments, Jesse. It's harder to leave a family than a job, and then this it's a choose your own adventure or choose your own path and. I love those two comments. I'm, I'm very just passionate about those two comments that you made, but we can't teach them what a family is. We can't show them what paths they could take potentially when they get here until we get them here. So I'm so glad that we talked about everything we talked about today in terms of how do we get them there, this high schools, the different programs that are out there, the representation we have as firefighters everywhere we go. This has been a great conversation. And I love the, the comments that were made on Facebook and online. And um, I think we covered a lot of ground today. So this has been a great conversation.
Fire. Well, I, uh, I, I still have Glenn looking for the bubble juice for the leveler and a left-handed monkey wrench. Uh, Jesse. <laughs> a left-handed smoke shifter. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly right. And uh, the other thing I think to keep in mind, especially with this conversation, is that pe people don't quit jobs. They quit bosses. So if you want to create a family atmosphere, make sure that, the, that somebody feels like they're the parent. You know what I mean? Somebody sets the tone and, and somebody you know, sets the boundaries for what we do here and what we don't do here. And, and, and that's how you create a family. There's always a mom and a dad. Um, and, and she's the first face of baby sees and they recognize. So to Garrett's point, when he's shaking hands with those 20 people, that's the first face they see. That, that's dad. You know what I mean? That's a, or that's mom or whatever. You know what I mean? That's the person that, you know, and when you accept that responsibility, you own it, right? If they find dad in a bar, uh, you know, three weeks after they started or two years after they started and he's drunk on his ear, acting like an idiot, that's a problem. That's a real problem. You, you fall, you, you climb slowly and you fall fast. So um, keep that in mind as we talk about, you know, how we're recruiting and, and who we're recruiting in, in terms of our own personal development and evaluation constantly. And um, I, I, again, I agree. Uh, amazing conversation as always. I think the Instructor Society does a wonderful job. If you're a firefighter out there and you're not a member of the International Society of Fire Service Instructors, please go to their website, the International Association of Fire Se Society of Fire Service Instructors. Uh, it's I think 35 bucks or something, or 135 bucks or something like that. What is it? It's a, so it's 135 bucks for an annual membership. So not 130, 135 bucks. You get that you get back. 10% off FDIC. So you, get your, you get it. You get it back with your registration at FDIC. Um, so you know there. There you go. So it's a wash, and uh, you, you just can't. The, the the toolkits that they can help you get, the networking they can help you to get. You can you'll you'll make friends with people like Jesse and Brian and Garrett and Steve and 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 well maybe not me and Glenn because you have to come to the nursing home that the. the Nursing Home Instructor Society. Well, I'm going to Fireman's Home in Booth. One of the two Fireman's Home in the country. One in New Jersey, one in New York. I'm going to the Jersey. Yeah, the, the, well, I was on the board for Fastly. For That's the, right. The New York. So he and I got. So I got my. We got places, to, we got go places to go here. That's but, awesome. It, but it was a great conversation, and I do I do want to thank the uh, International Association of Fire Service Instructors for the work they do, and and yep. the model that they set for the rest of us. They really do, and and uh, um, great group of men and women doing really great work. And, and uh, thank you, Jesse. It's always great to, to hear and see Jesse. And uh, I'm happy that you're now on the board and hope to see a whole lot more of you because you really, you've been writing and speaking for a long time and, and always with a tremendous amount of not only insight, but empathy and kindness. And, and it always comes across. And so it was really great to see you. And to everybody else out there, I don't know that I'll be making another hangout um, I've got some travel coming up with the holidays and such. So if I if I don't see everybody out there, uh, my very best to everybody for the, for the Christmas holiday or whatever holiday you celebrate. I think uh, uh, Hanukkah is also coming up and, and mm -hmm. several others. So just the, all the best to everybody. Uh, and, and thank you again, Brian, for having us on. Yep. Yep. Well, thank, thank you guys. And once again, you know, make sure you guys get registered for FDIC. It's going to fill up fast and as Chief Alden alluded to, please join the ISFSI. It's uh, 135 bucks a year. It's a great opportunity to network and uh, get training materials and be part of a network of training instructors, officers from across the world. We just got a uh, we just got a member from Kenya today. Our first member from Kenya joined. So you know we are truly represented by uh, everyone in the world. So 135 bucks ISFSI.org. So appreciate the conversation, everyone, as always, and we will see you in two months. Thanks, guys. Take care. Happy holidays. Wonderful.